Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, June 8th, 2015. Here are our top stories. Tonight, checkpoints, harassment, and Cobra Commandos. This isn't your granddaddy smoke-filled room. This is Bilderberg 2015. These are villains that showing off around boardrooms, they go, we're liberal, did you hear? We want to help the children. <laughs> I love being liberal. <laughs> Never mind secret groups meeting in the Austrian Alps. Well, InfoWars reporters are on the ground in Austria to cover the Bilderberg groups meeting this week. But so are the police in massive numbers. Very different from last year. Look at this article from Kit Daniels. Bilderberg uh, cops have set up a Chernobyl-style exclusion zone around the secretive meeting of world leaders and points out this is over three times the size of Manhattan. There's more than 2,000 police officers roaming the Austrian countryside, setting up roadside checkpoints to keep reporters and the public miles away from the Interalpen Hotel where the event is being held. And he sums it up by saying, simply put, the Austrian police are telling journalists they do not have access to a public area that is over three times the size of Manhattan, assuming the exclusion zone is roughly a 10 kilometer circle around the Interalpen Hotel with it at the center. A very different situation than we saw last year in Copenhagen. Last year in Copenhagen, they had us just on the other side of a four-lane road. We were able to watch people come and go. That was very, very unusual for any Bilderberg meeting. People were commenting about how unusual that was. Perhaps they were uncomfortable with reporters being as close as we were last year. We were able to see them talking with each other during breaks on the balcony and the terrace. We were able to see them going for jogs. Uh, this year, they have people back miles away, and the Austrian police are very in your face, as we saw from the reports of Rob Dew and Josh Owens this afternoon. It may also have something to do with uh, some secret visitors that may be coming to see them. We have an official list up on InfoWars right now, the uh, full attendee list, they say, and the agenda, the official list from Bilderberg. But of course, this is a secretive group. You don't expect them to be very candid about what they're doing. They're telling us that they're going to be talking about globalization. Really? Globalization? As uh, Charlie Skelton, one of the reporters uh, for The Guardian, who always covers Bilderberg, says, as if anything they've ever discussed could be put under that uh, heading. Of course, that's all that they do is talk about globalization. They're also going to be talking, though, about U.S. elections. They make that very clear. The people that are going to be there, of course, are people like Ed Balls. We saw him last year as he was uh, pulling out his suitcase full of documents. But, of course, Bilderberg says there's no minutes taken. There's no reports written. No policy statements are issued. Yeah, they're not going to tell us what they do there. But believe me, they are taking in a lot of information. Ed Balls was the highest ranking official to lose his uh, seat in this last election in the UK. He had been shadow secretary of the Exchequer, uh, essentially the position of uh, secretary of the Treasury here in the United States for the opposition. They say that they're going to be operating, of course, under Chatham House rules. That's a special uh, set of rules that they've created for themselves. Uh, that's something that came out of England. Of course, we have something in the U.S. called the Logan Act, uh, but, you know, we kind of have a moratorium right now on enforcing laws against elite corporations and U.S. government officials for the time being. But that's going to come back. We're going to see that that's, uh, that's going to come back. Now, looking at some of the other people on the list, of course, we see David Petraeus. This will be, I think, his third in a row where he's going. Of course, Henry Kissinger, the perennial uh, Princess Beatrice. We also have people from... HSBC and Goldman Sachs, all the banks are there as well as the media. I guess the banks are there just to show that there's no hard feelings after having been hit for uh, kind of a slap on the wrist fines for some of the uh, largest riggings of markets, pretty much every market everywhere. HSBC, of course, with multiple people here at the Bilderberg, uh, they've been convicted multiple times of doing money laundering for drug dealers, uh, drug cartels, as well as terrorist groups. We also have another interesting uh, group of people there, and that's the ones from Google this year. There's an article up on InfoWars from Paul Joseph Watson. Google executive behind the ingestible ID chips is going to be attending Bilderberg this year. She's one of three executives from uh, Google that will be there this year. Uh, she is a former DARPA director. 
that should uh, raise some eyebrows because there's been a lot of acquisitions that indicate that Google may be moving into a full-out military industrial complex uh, posturing. We saw after the DARPA robotics contest last year that they acquired all of the most promising corporations that were involved in that. They were brought in, and of course, uh, besides Eric Schmidt, who is the CEO of Google, and this uh, DARPA uh, executive that's uh, their former DARPA executive, uh, they also have Demis Hassabis, who is the vice president for Google uh, Deep Mind. This is a um, artificial intelligence program where they do not program the artificial intelligence, but it learns. So they are creating a, um, an artificial intelligence that's capable of learning. Now, going back to this uh, particular ingestible chip idea that comes from this former uh, DARPA personnel, uh, DARPA director actually, uh, now working for Google, the pill has a small chip inside of it with a switch, she said. It also has what amounts to an inside-out potato battery. When you swallow it, the acids in your stomach serve as the electrolyte that powers it up. The switch goes on and off and creates an 18-bit ECG, electroencephalogram, and she says, essentially, your entire body becomes your authentication token. Isn't that special? Now, they point out that the chip has already been approved by the FDA. That also helps you when you have uh, connections in high places where you can make friendly relations at uh, Bilderberg. You can do it in secret. Now, as I mentioned earlier, many people are asking about these connections with the military and Google. One is The Wire's Adam Clark Estes. He says, what in the world does Google have planned that it's hiring military leadership. That's right. What in the world do they have planned? Well, the other aspect, of course, uh, with Bilderberg is the politicians. We just had the G7. Uh, that happened in uh, Germany not far away. Now we have the people who are the real rulers, not the political puppets that they control. But, of course, we will see political puppets making a, a visit, making an appearance here. Uh, as uh, Steve Watson points out, it uh, looks like Bilderberg might be backing Hillary for the 2016 presidency. Certainly, she has a strong supporter who is on the official attendee list. He points out the Bilderberg 2015 conference this weekend in Austria will focus, at least in part, they say, on the American elections. Now, one of the people there is Jim Messina. He was the head of Barack Obama's re-election campaign in 2012. And he's just come back to the United States after leading the deeply unpopular UK Prime Minister David Cameron to a surprise majority victory in British elections. So this is a guy with a very strong track record in uh, getting people elected, uh, certainly getting David Cameron elected. That was a, quite a bit of surprise for everyone. He says, I'm coming home tomorrow, he told MSNBC, and it's whatever it will take to get Hillary elected. So that's now his focus after getting an unpopular uh, prime minister re-elected in the UK. Now, Watson points out in his article that in 2008, of course, the Bilderberg Group met with both Clinton and Obama when they had it in Northern Virginia. He points out that in years past, the elitist uh, James A. Johnson had a direct hand in selecting Obama's running mate for the 2008 election and also selected Jerry, John Kerry's running mate, John Edwards, in 2004 after Edwards impressed Bilderberg elitist Henry Kissinger and David Rockefeller with a speech that he gave in Italy that year. Now the question is, uh, of course, uh, Hillary Clinton has her man on the inside, the guy who is dedicated to getting her reelected. Uh, how about uh, any of the other politicians? Well, it turns out, just so coincidentally, that Jeb Bush is not going to be very far from where this meeting is going to be taking place. He has scheduled a trip to Europe. Matter of fact, he's going to be in Berlin tomorrow for two days. And that's only about a two and a half hour plane flight with a commercial flight from that area. So easily he could uh, travel secretly to this meeting. And of course, he has someone on the inside that has a very strong track record as well. Robert Zellick, who is now the chair of international advisors at Goldman Sachs, is somebody that has a very long history with the Bush family. Uh, he's been managing director of Goldman Sachs. He headed a CFR committee back in 2005 on the North American Union. Ted Cruz's wife, Heidi, was part of that uh, organization, that, that uh, recommendation from the uh, CFR committee on North America. They recommended a common border around uh, North America. That's what David Petraeus, Bilderberg attendee, has said. That's what comes after America is North America, meaning the North American Union, saying that we're now 
20 years into NAFTA. And of course, a recommendation that came out of that CFR committee, chaired by Robert Zellig, with Heidi uh, Cruz as one of the 30 members there, they recommended that there would be a security perimeter around the three countries. And of course, NORTHCOM was created just back in 2002, perhaps for that same purpose. Its jurisdiction is Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. Maybe we should say the former countries of Canada, U.S., and Mexico. Now, Zellig was also the U.S. Uh, Department, uh, the Deputy Secretary of State under W. Bush. He was also U.S. Trade Representative under W. Bush, but his history goes back even to George H. W. Bush. He was the counselor of the U.S. Department of State, and he was president of the World Bank. So, Jeb Bush is well represented as well as Hillary Clinton, and of course, he is in the area. We'll be looking for further updates, and we're going to have a lot of reports from our reporters this week in the area. Uh, it's going to be hard for them to get the kind of shots that we did last year. If you look at some of these shots that we've got here, we were just, as I said, right across the street. We could see them coming and going very easily, so it was kind of uh, easy to keep tabs on them. Perhaps this year is why they went to a remote location with such heavy security, with such a large perimeter, because perhaps they want to have some uh, secret guest come in. Now stay with us right after the break. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about the Trans-Pacific Partnership and how that relates to this secretive organization that has been meeting for decades. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Now before us today are several trade agreements that are coming at us very quickly. Of course, we've now had the Senate pass a fast-track trade agreement. One of the senators who's looked at this, Senator Jeff Sessions, is outraged at what he has seen. We're going to go over that in a minute, but I want you to understand where this is all headed. This is certainly not about trade. This is about economic and political union. It's about global governance. It was 60 years ago in the same city where the G7 just met that Bilderberg laid down the plans for a unified Europe, talking about how they were going to bring it together economically and then bring it together as a sovereign union. They laid down the plans for the European Union as well as the euro currency. Of course, we had the NAFTA agreement that was created 20 years ago. David Petraeus says we now have a North American Union. We are now post-America. That should explain to a lot of people who are scratching their heads about what's going on at our borders, what is really going on at our borders. As Nancy Pelosi said, we just have two communities that happen to have a border running through it that to them means nothing more than the border that runs between Texas and Oklahoma, for example. But it was 42 years ago that Zbigniew Brzezinski and David Rockefeller put together the Trilateral Commission, the goal of which was to unify the three blocks that they saw, North America, Europe, and Asia. And now we see that with these trade partnerships, but they are not partnerships. The words that no one will use, the word that no one will use, is treaty. But Jeff Sessions, a senator who actually took the time to go down and look at one of these secret agreements, lays it out in a letter, a public letter that he uh, put out. It's an open letter, but it's a letter to Obama. This is what he has to say. He says, when they passed this fast-track trade agreement, there were some very troubling concessions. He said, these concessions include the power to write legislation, the power to amend legislation, the power to fully consider legislation on the floor. Those have all been abdicated. You understand that? Okay, they're not writing this treaty. It's been written for them. They do not have the power to amend that treaty. They don't even have any power to control how that treaty gets to the floor. It will automatically get there in 45 days max. They can only accelerate it. They can do nothing to stop it, nothing to amend it. And he said the power to keep debate open on the Senate floor until cloture is invoked. In other words, they take away the ability to have a filibuster. And the most important thing, he said, is the constitutional requirement that treaties receive a two-thirds vote. You see, the TPA, the Trade Promotion Authority that just passed in the Senate, only received 62 votes. That should tell you something. That is the mechanism to pass these trade agreements that are before us. And it's not just the TPP or the TTIP, the Transatlantic and Trans-Pacific Agreements that we've been talking about for a long time. There's now another agreement the TISA, and there will be many more because this fast-track trade authority is going to give to the executive, to Obama and to the president who comes after him, the capability to do executive trade agreements essentially without Congress's approval. Under fast-track, there has never been 
a treaty that has been rejected. They have skewed it so much that uh, it will not happen. He says, the idea that it is a treaty, he writes, to continue, continuing on in his letter, is especially important. He says it's clear that it more closely resembles a treaty than a trade deal. Through fast track, Congress would be pre-clearing a political and economic union before a word of that arrangement has been made available to a single private citizen. Ah, but see, we are not stakeholders. We're not the ones who are creating this, and they say we don't have a stake. We're not allowed to see it, and of course, it tells you something, doesn't it? when our elected representatives are muzzled and gagged and controlled like this. It tells you who the real controllers are. That's why I say the G7 that everybody paid so much attention to, and now you see the media completely ignoring Bilderberg, Bilderberg is where the real power brokers go. Now, this is the thing that concerns him. It's not just the fact that the Congress, through this fast track process, has essentially signed the Enabling Act of the 21st century. Remember the Enabling Act of 1933 was when the Reichstag signed over all legislative authority to de Fuhrer, to Adolf Hitler. That's precisely what the Senate has done with this trade promotion authority, and they do not have the authority to do that. They, would, they have to follow the Constitution. I think we need to oppose this based on the fact that it is a treaty, and they cannot amend the constitutional requirements for passing a treaty by passing a resolution or passing a law. But there's something else about this that's even more troubling in the long run. And that is, even though they will not be able to amend this agreement, once it is passed, he points out, there is a new transnational governance structure known as the Trans-Pacific Partnership Commission. This new, government's, new governance commission, he says, uh, has extremely broad powers. It will have the hallmarks of a nascent European Union with many similarities. This is the senator who has actually read the agreement. As I point out, there's only been a couple who have seen it. Rand Paul has seen it. We are getting a detailed, the most detailed overview of the dangers of this from Senator Sessions that we've seen from anyone so far. He says this new transnational commission, chartered with a living agreement clause, would have the authority to amend the agreement after its adoption to add new members, to issue regulations impacting labor, immigration, environmental, and commercial policy. In other words, our Congress will not be allowed to amend this, these trade agreements, but once they are passed, this new transnational governance structure called the Trans-Pacific Partnership Commission will be able to change it at will, including other countries like China. We're told this has to be done as a block against China China could be admitted the day after this is passed by Congress. And then he finally points out, in effect, to adopt fast track is to agree to remove the constitutional protections against the creation of global governance structures before these structures are even made public. Congress, he says, should not even consider fast tracking the transfer of sovereign power to a transnational structure before the details of that structure are made fully available for public review. Precisely. This is a massive change in sovereignty. And this is being done by the people who already have the power. They are rapidly consolidating power and wealth into their hands. We see this article today from InfoWars. A billionaire warns us that social unrest is going to escalate as robots will fuel mass unemployment. Billionaire Johann Rupert says we're in for a huge change in society. He's a billionaire who made his money with Cartier jewelry and Chloe Fashion. He said, tension between the rich and the poor is set to escalate as robots and artificial intelligence will fuel mass unemployment. And of course, we've talked about this many times. The estimates range anywhere from 50 to 90% unemployment within the next 10 years. He says, we cannot have 0.1% of 0.1% taking all of the spoils. Now, he himself has $7.5 billion. He says, though, how is society going to cope with structural unemployment and the envy, hatred, and social welfare. We are destroying the middle classes at this stage, and it will affect us, the global elite. He goes on to say, how is society going to cope with structural unemployment and the envy, hatred, and social warfare? We are destroying the middle classes at this stage, and it will affect us. In other words, the billionaires. He says it's unfair. So that's what keeps me awake at night. Well, you know, there's some things that keep me awake at night, too. When I look at where this is headed, it looks very bad. Look at this article from uh, the Wall Street Journal talking about apartments in Hong Kong. 
Look at the future of Agenda 21, where they talk about mosquito apartments. These are apartments that are even under the 200 square feet, the apartments that are being uh, touted to us by uh, this Agenda 21, UN Agenda 21. Here's a case in Hong Kong. Of course, this is the worst case scenario, a highly populated city uh, with very little land, but that's precisely what they're going to create with Agenda 21, making most of the land off limits to people crowding us into a high density population as we see in Hong Kong. So here we have an apartment with 180 square feet going for half a million US dollars, $516,000. He says, even by Hong Kong's cramped standards, apartments are getting tinier and tinier. They're calling them mosquito sized. He says, this is part, however, of a broader trend of rising values of residential real estate in major cities around the world. Now, listen to this one. This is uh, in a development called Montvert, also in Hong Kong. These are apartments that are smaller than 180 square feet. He said there were a lot of YouTubes that are, uh, YouTube videos that are out showing people using their arms spread out to measure the living area. The living area is so small you can reach it by sticking your arms out on either side. How is this going? Now, as we see some of the billionaires concerned about this and concerned about how this is going to break down, we have others, like the CEO of Uber, who are rushing headlong into a future where they own everything and where they don't need any people. The question for Uber, I think, when he says, you're going to get to the point where our taxis are going to be very cheap once we get the driver out of the car. Once we have self-driving taxis, then the dude in the car goes away. It gets so cheap that private ownership of vehicles goes away. And I would ask him, if this is happening everywhere, not just in the taxi business, who's going to be able to afford to even ride in his cars? Of course, Uber is going to have transportation that is Uber always. He's going to be the one who owns everything. Look at what he just did this last week. They went to Carnegie Mellon, a place that has a very long history of robotics, of self-driving cars, and they basically hired away the entire robotics research staff. 40 key robotics researchers out of Carnegie Mellon essentially shut down their department. And then to try to make nice, they gave them a grant of uh, several, uh, several million dollars. They're able to do this because they can raise massive amount of money on Wall Street. They just raised $5 billion. Then they go out and they buy the entire engineering department of Carnegie Mellon. Now, of course, we've seen massive automation and displacement in other industries, for example, in agriculture. Nevertheless, what is fundamentally different about this is not only the attitude of the corporate elite, like the uh, CEO of Uber, but also the idea that it isn't just going to be the transportation workers who are losing their jobs, it's going to be everyone. And if we look at the impact of these trade treaties that are coming up before us, we see that it's going to affect not only jobs, but it's going to affect privacy, information, it's going to affect our medicine, our food, as well as setting up the corporations, the multinational corporations, to be on a level that is equivalent to our governments. With more details on how this looks with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, here's a report from John Bound. The Trans-Pacific Partnership trade package is beginning to unravel, with more prominent voices slamming President Obama and the Republican leadership over the secretive deal that threatens to cost American jobs and hand big corporations new powers that would violate national sovereignty. House Majority Whip Representative Steve Scalise of Louisiana and Rules Committee Chairman Representative Pete Sessions of Texas refused to reveal to Breitbart whether they had read the TPP agreement but still said they would support the Trade Promotion Authority and allow President Barack Obama to fast-track the TPP. Lawmakers claim that TPA is separate from TPP and that they will review the final TPP agreement before it is considered by Congress. However, as Matthew Boyle explains, this explanation doesn't wash. A vote for the TPA is a de facto green light for the TPP since there is essentially no way to halt a trade deal once it has been fast-tracked. Boyle writes, since Fast Track was created in the Richard Nixon administration, not one trade deal that started on Fast Track has been thwarted. As such, a vote for TPA is a vote for TPP, since passing TPA will all but guarantee the successful passage of TPP. Senator Marco Rubio, Senator Lindsey Graham, and Representative John Boehner are also refusing to reveal if they have visited the secret room to read the controversial TPP document although all three are set to vote for the TPA. Daniel Horowitz, senior editor of the Conservative Review, writes, 
It is unforgivable for the Republican majority to shirk its congressional duty and refuse to read the text of a bill that will give Obama unprecedented authority over our economy. Passing a bill in order to find out what's in it is what placed the Pelosi Congress in the ash heap of history. It's not an auspicious path for ambitious politicians. The Washington Post reports the push from the president included direct calls to lawmakers, interviews with television stations in key states, and plans to bring several Democrats aboard Air Force One with him. Meanwhile, despite claims that climate change mandates would not be a part of TPP, President Obama admitted during an NPR interview on Wednesday that this would indeed be the case. By passing such mandates via the TPP, Obama could sneak through draconian climate regulations under the radar knowing that they would almost certainly be rejected by Congress on their own. This would satisfy calls by the likes of French Foreign Minister Laurent Fabius, a Bilderberg member, to enforce the new rules via global treaties to cut Congress out of the equation. Obama will attend summit in Paris in December to negotiate a climate agreement. Howard Richman writes, Obama would not need to get Congress to approve the unfair climate change treaty terms that he negotiates. Instead, he could get the commission set up by the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement to add those terms to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. After that, the investor state dispute settlement provision set up by that agreement could enforce Obama's terms through the threat of multi-billion dollar fines upon the U.S. government. Physicians are rallying as they become increasingly concerned about the passage of TPP. Prescription drug costs could waylay the affordability of biologics, and thousands of prescription drugs by drastically altering intellectual property protections. Under the TPP, corporations could sue countries for restricting their products due to legislation brought to fruition by their own government policies. The investor state dispute settlement portion of the TPP gives the upper hand. Legislative bodies would only act as advisory boards to the ruling corporatic governments. Most recently, the World Trade Organization Tribunal ruled against the United States in a NAFTA suit brought by Canada and Mexico that claimed the U.S. country of origin labeling law, which requires foreign meat to be labeled as such, is an unfair and illegal trade practice. The WTO's May 18th ruling was the fourth time in three years that the global court had ruled against Cool. Even though U.S. courts had ruled that Cool is legal, faced with WTO penalties and threats of retaliation, the U.S. Congress is now considering repeal of Cool and American consumers may soon lose the ability to discover if the meat at the grocery store or restaurant is U.S. raised or from Mexico, Brazil, or China. Critics of the TPP assert that the trade deal will cost American jobs and give huge corporations the power to change U.S. laws. John Bound for Infowars.com Now, there's two sides to medical tyranny. We're now looking at mandatory vaccines that remove our informed consent, but the other side of that is prohibiting us from taking alternative medicine that is safe and effective, medicine that we choose to take. That's the other way they can remove your consent. Of course, it's all being done for a medical cabal. The big pharmaceutical companies, the AMA, they're shutting it down. Now we see, of course, the tool that they use is the FDA and they are coming after osteopaths. We see that the U.S. Food and Drug Administration is taking a look at alternative medicine and quote-unquote natural cures. Without your comments, they could soon be unavailable. And as they point out, uh, though homeopathy is one of the alternative medicines that carries a heavy controversial label, should the people not be able to pursue relatively harmless alternative medicine instead of choosing side effect riddled pharmaceutical drugs? In other words, you have the right to choose what you put in your body as medication. That's the essence of informed consent. And they can remove that by mandating certain things for you. They can also do that by prohibiting certain things from you. And of course, we see with the FDA the same kind of approach that we're going to be faced with with these trans-Pacific, transatlantic partnerships, the kind of uh, independent body that's once it's created is going to rewrite the laws without any input from the people. That's what we have right now in Washington. We have all these different organizations like the FDA, like the EPA. They write new rules and regulations prohibiting outdoor barbecues or fireplaces, whatever it is uh, the, of the uh, week that they want to prohibit. 
and we are essentially powerless to stop them. We have had the Congress abdicate its authority to them, and now they're about to do it on the international level. Now, one of the ways, of course, that we're very familiar with is marijuana. And of course, there's medical marijuana. We just had a law passed here in Texas that recognized that medical marijuana was the most effective treatment for certain types of epileptic seizures. Nevertheless, they still require you to go through the conventional treatment before you're eligible to try that. You have to be recommended by a doctor. And of course, the catch-22 in all this is that the federal government does not recognize officially medical marijuana laws passed at the state level. We can see how that's playing out in Washington state. This article from Infowars.com, medical marijuana growers in Washington are facing prison. Three of the Kettle Falls five are scheduled to be sentenced this week. Now, what happened is, and this is amazing the way they were railroaded through this trial, but this is something we have come to expect from the insane war on drugs, the war on drugs that gave us the idea of civil asset forfeiture, where they could charge your property with a crime, confiscate it without ever uh, convicting you of a crime, let alone not even charging you with a crime. They could just say that your property was somehow tangentially involved and just confiscate it. Do it as a civil action so that they say that you don't have any rights under the due process guarantees of the Constitution. In this particular case, what they did was during the trial at a federal courthouse in Spokane last March, the defendants were not allowed to explain why they were openly growing marijuana on a plot in a rural northeastern Washington marked by a big green cross visible from the air. So they're doing it in the open. They mark it with a great big green cross, but no, they were not allowed to explain what was going on to it. According to the pretrial ruling, it was irrelevant that they were using marijuana for medical purposes as permitted by state law. See, they were in compliance with state law, but the feds were the ones who came after them. And the feds were the ones who prohibited them from saying anything about it being medical marijuana. They just came after them as if they were drug dealers, not as if they were complying with the state law. They say, although no one was supposed to talk about medical marijuana during the trial, the prosecution kept stumbling onto the subject because it was clearly relevant to the questions of where the pot went, which was central to the case. Now it is coming into the sentencing phase. Hopefully the truth will come out, but we're seeing this happening not only in Washington state, we're seeing it happen in many other states where they pass state laws saying that medical marijuana is legal. Then they come in and arrest the people or send them to jail or do what they did in Michigan. Here's a story from the Washington Post. Why armed drug cops took everything belonging, every belonging rather, from a Michigan soccer mom. They say, after they breached my door at gunpoint with masks, she said, they proceeded to take every belonging in my house. And when I say every belonging, I mean every belonging. Her husband's tools, a lawnmower, a bicycle. They even took $90 worth of birthday money out of her daughter's pink bedroom, as listed in the summary of seized property that was compiled by the police. She said, my children's artwork was on the floor with boot prints on it. They hung my lingerie from the ceiling fan, she said. They took her vehicles, including the car seats for her small children. Why did they do this? She was a registered medical marijuana caregiver. And the police said this, they thought that she might, might be out of compliance. You see how upside down, how perverted our system of justice is. That they think that she might be out of compliance. They don't charge her with anything. She's not found guilty. They just go in and take everything, every belonging of hers. Then we see that, of course, uh, the judge was even outraged with this. He said, why would you keep several items that are stated here, he asked the prosecution, unless you just want to be nasty about it? He said, uh, I'm just saying that from a pure matter of acting like a decent human being, those things are not going to be necessary, ought to be given back. Even if the charges against them are dropped completely, the Washington Post points out, they will still face a steep legal battle to get all their stuff back because it's very difficult to get seized property back even when you are found to be innocent, because it's not a criminal case. Under civil asset forfeiture, there's not an issue of guilt or innocence. They just take whatever they want. They can be vindictive and nasty about it, or they can take very valuable things and use it for their own personal gain. And we see that happening with law enforcement and with uh, district attorney's offices throughout the country. And then they point out another case, one other case, this is uh, Jennifer Hensey. Like Annette Shatuk, Hensey is a self-described soccer mom and also a registered medical marijuana caregiver. 
She says they took everything from her as well, the TVs, the kids' phones, ladders. She was initially charged with two marijuana-related offenses, but the charges were dismissed by the judge. She was very happy about it. She drove to the county prosecutor's office to see about getting her belongings back, but the county said they're going to be keeping all that. Quote, the prosecutor came out to me and said, well, I can still beat you in civil court. Yeah, when we have a situation where inanimate objects are charged with crimes, it's a, such an upside-down situation, you certainly can. Take a look at this next story and ask yourself, who is the real stormtrooper? We've got a guy who is dressed up like a stormtrooper out of uh, Star Wars, and he's uh, in Massachusetts. He's walking along, going to a friend's house. He happens to walk in front of a school, and it creates a panic event. George Cross, 40, of Lynn, Massachusetts, was arrested. The principal thought that the gun was a toy, but he said, you can never be too safe. You know what? You can be too safe. This is a good example of being too safe. You can create so much security that you turn our society into a maximum security prison. That's what a prison is. It's maximum security. He was dressed as a Star Wars character. He was carrying a blaster, they say. And they point out that uh, he said, I thought it was a costume. I was walking through the neighborhood. I was just showing friends, all that. He says, all of a sudden, the police show up. and They take him down. They say, the way things are today, you just can't have that. That's the excuse from the Principal, that's the excuse from the police. The police report said the principal realized the gun was plastic, but as I said before, you can never be too safe. So who is the real stormtrooper? And can we have too much security? We can if it becomes our primary objective. Remember that there is no trade-off between liberty and safety. Slaves are never safe. And to the degree that you trade off your liberty, to that degree, you become a slave. Well, that's our news for tonight. If you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you want to see it every night as it happens, you can subscribe to our Prison Planet TV broadcast. That will allow you to share the news each night with 20 of your friends, as well as have access to all of Alex Jones's documentaries. Monday through Friday, we're here at 7 Central. Join us then tomorrow night. We'll have more updates on our reports from Bilderberg.